Good evening. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. We'll get started here in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and share on Facebook. Share. Share now. Okay. Well, happy Wednesday, everyone. I hope everybody had a good day so far. Oh, yes. yes it's been a blessed day. Amen. Amen. We had a wonderful time Sunday. Yes, oh, yeah. it was very nice. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kinston Jones, that's a preacher right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of energy. Well, I wasn't ready for all that. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> he, talked about, he talked about praise. <laughs> Men of God. Oh, yes. He said, we ought to pray and we ought to praise. There's power in praise, power in prayer. Yes, it is. Yeah. Great message. All right. Well, I think we're all set. Let's go ahead and get into our study for tonight. We're going to finish up chapter four. If anyone is thirsty, the next chapter, chapter five, is titled Spring Living Water then why so much pain? Yeah, uh, I, I've really enjoyed this chapter so far. Um, it's all been good. I feel the author is really building up to something. Um, I believe by the time we get to the end of the book, we'll be able to connect all the dots that he's trying to get us to connect. Um, he's bringing out some different terms, having us look at things a little differently, helping us to go below the surface. Uh, of just being, you know, a surface Christian, but he's encouraging us to really, you know, don't be afraid of what's what's in the dark recesses in your heart and in your mind, because we all have those little dark spots that we don't want to look at. <laughs> but there's there's uh, there's a blessing, I believe, if we do uncover those things, those hurts, those pains, those. Um, Things we don't want to talk about, they're not going to go away unless we bring them out into the light. Um, on our men's call this morning, uh, our teacher was telling us about, um, um, you know, life is short. So, you know, kind of, uh, he, he was talking, telling the men that we ought to treat ourselves, you know. Um, life is short. Uh, take care of yourself. Um, be good to yourself. Um, we do so much for other people, you know, uh, often, especially as believers, you know, we're always giving, giving, giving. But you need to just take some some self time for yourself, some, some me time, I guess the word calls it. people call it today, me time. So uh, it was good. But um, all right, let's take some God time now. <laughs> let's get into prayer. Uh, Father, just thank you right now for allowing us to come together one more time. We pray and thank you for each and every one that comes on faithfully each Wednesday. Uh, those that are dialing in on the phone, those who are on Facebook, and those who will join on YouTube. We pray for new life. We just thank you, Lord, that uh, we feel you moving. We see you doing things. People are coming. Um, I don't know if this is a, a start of a revival. But God, we just thank you, and we're, we're anxious to see what you're doing and how you're going to do it, and that you're going to use us to be a part of what you do. So Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the small victories. Uh, we could focus on our problems all day and all night, but Lord, we choose to focus on you, who is our problem solver. We turn everything over to you. We don't carry around hurts and aggression and unforgiveness in our hearts. Lord, we forgive and we love because that's what you commanded us to do. We put you first and others second. And if we keep things in that order, we know that you'll take care of us as well. So, Lord, every provision that needs to be met, we, we pray, Father, that you attend to our needs. You are our supply. You are our 
greatest uh, source. So Lord, we ask you now to heal those who are recovering from surgery right now. We we lift up uh, Deacon Cowan. I believe he had surgery yesterday. We ask you to strengthen him and heal him. We pray, Father, for Pastor Cowan. Continue to touch him and uh, give him strength, Lord, to lead us. We pray for First Lady by his side. We pray for all of the ministry leaders, heads of ministries. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the lay people, those who are involved in ministry, even though they're not in the leadership position. Everyone is valuable in the body. There's no uh, big eyes or little U's. We're all part of the body. We all have a role to play. Your Holy Spirit has gifted each one of us in a special way. And I pray that we all find our gift and walk in our gift and contribute to the kingdom. Father, we pray right now, not only for new life, but uh, every church that opens its doors in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you again to bless our families, bless our children and grandchildren and great grands. And uh, we pray for parents. We pray for marriages. We pray for our schools. We pray for our government. We ask you, Father, to intervene, to inject yourself through us into the different uh, areas of life. You called us to be that salt and that light. Lord, help us to build up your kingdom. Now, Father, help us to read your word, to understand it better. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. 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 All right. All right. Inside out. Um, so I want to I want to start with something. Those of you who are online, you can see this picture. But uh, if you're not, um, you just hear the story. Uh, I was out in Lincolnton on Buffalo Shoals Road uh, yesterday uh, for work. And uh, I saw this uh, sign and very strange objects in the yard. Uh, it says, what is this? What Nick Rodan harm? It sounds kind of Eastern. I looked it up and it, it's a Buddhist, I don't know if it's a Buddhist uh, 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 farm, a Buddhist something or other, but it's tied to Buddhism. So this is a sign on the on this big field here. But as you keep going, let me show you the next picture. Uh, I don't know why my friend want me to show this. <laughs> here we go. Here's the other picture. Now I'm going to zoom in here. And if you can see those statues way in the back there, those of you who are online. But there are these 10 to 12 foot statues of something, Buddha, uh, some religious symbols. And it looks pretty, pretty weird from the street. Um, but it, I just bring this up just to show you that not everyone believes like we believe. Uh, there are other religions, other thoughts out there. But I want us to be encouraged to hold to our faith. Right. Uh, yes, we we know who the King of Kings is. We know who the Lord of Lords is. We yeah. know who to pray to. Amen. 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 But just seeing this out in the middle of, you know, this kind of rural area was really strange. Um, but yeah, I, I had to get a picture of it and show show uh my my church family here, but I don't know what that is, but we're not going to focus on the enemy tonight. We're going to focus on our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, but I was talking about, yeah. I, I remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about, uh, I was having conversations uh, with a uh, transgender person about their faith and about God. And they really seemed to be making some strides. I was sending them Bible verses, you know, the ones that, uh, I don't know if you're on pastor's text chain, but I was sending those to her and and this person, her, him, they were really enjoying it, it seemed. And um, uh, but then we we got to talking about once again about change. And this person was saying, Well, will God accept me as I am? And I said, Yes. However, God requires all of us to change. We've all had to change something, right? Yes. Yes. On our journey. Mm -hmm. Yes. We come to him as we are, but we certainly cannot stay as we are. The mm -hmm. very nature of God is holy and, and, and change and growth and maturity. And, uh, you know, Paul said, when I was young, I, I, I thought like a child. I spoke as a child, you know, but now I've left childish things behind. So 
I don't know. We all have something we need to leave behind when we come to cross, come to Christ. Well, come to the cross and come to Christ. So um, this person started talking about Mother Nature and how Mother Nature had been good to her. And, and I said, well, how do you know Mother Nature is good to you? And and they said, well, I, I just know uh, she allowed me to get this uh, rescued. I think she rescued some kind of animal. I said, oh, wow, that's cool. You know, I said, well, who is Mother Nature? And there was this long pause. This is an online conversation. I don't know this person and they don't know me. But, you know, just having uh, I, I just try to inject Christ in every conversation I have. And I said, well, who is Mother Nature? Does Mother Nature have any writings? And how do you? Who, uh, who is Mother Nature? And at that point, they started to get offended. You know, don't question who I believe in. And uh, Mother Nature created the world. That's what she, this, the person said. So I quickly grabbed my Bible on my online and copied and pasted uh, Genesis. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, this person blocked me and the chat was over. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I haven't heard from this person. I probably will never hear from them again. But, um, you know, we got to stand our ground. We cannot cave. Yeah. We have to represent. Yeah. Truth. yeah. Yeah. So you may lose some friends. Um, mm-hmm. you, may, you may lose some family members, unfortunately. Yeah. But we, we cannot yeah. compromise. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, I. If we're going to talk religion, I, I cannot leave the scripture out because it doesn't matter what I think and what I feel, right? Right. It, it's, right. It's not, uh, God doesn't need us to defend the Bible. He, he can defend it himself. No, no, no. <laughs> we're just messing mm-hmm. and we must present truth. And so, yeah, when I pasted that Genesis in there, the screen went blank and it said this person is no longer available. So I, I I pray that they maybe maybe I planted a seed and someone else will water it, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. But I just mm-hmm. wanted to share that with you that uh, I, I want to encourage somebody to stand your ground. You know, the world is standing their ground. They got to stand their ground rule in Florida. You can shoot anybody you feel like, apparently. But uh, we got to stand our ground. And stand on the word. Amen. 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 This is not the time to compromise. All right. Let's get back into our lesson for tonight. We're going to finish up chapter four. Um, Once again, I wish I, I, I cannot see the people who are on Facebook like I used to. I don't know why, but we will move on anyway. Um, we were on page 74 in the book that I have the white book with the blue cover. We were talking about how it feels to be disrespected in the fact, because God made us to matter. The, the author is getting to why we feel so dissatisfied all the time with everything. Because we were made to matter and this world can never meet our expectations. This world can never fulfill our need because only God can fulfill that need. Um, when you're not connected to God, you, you start building golden statues in your backyard, <laughs> like we see here. You know, This is something that somebody made with their own hands, man-made materials, but yet they will worship these things. Well, what sense does that make? You know, that, that's not God. That's you creating something to appease a need that's deep inside you. You start calling out to Mother Nature. Uh, who is Mother Nature? But we know who God is. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's got history. He's got documented history. He's got miracles that he's performed. And so we serve a real God. He's very real. He's not a myth. It's not story time on Sunday. You know, this is real. And I, I Jesus is coming back one day. And so our faith is very real. It's not in our minds. It's it's very real. God is both historical. He's factual. God covers science, medicine, uh, law. You know, our our laws today are built upon the Ten Commandments, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But mankind has done all that she can, he can, she can, to really run away from truth. And it's sad. And it's sad. Um, yeah, but we were talking about how it feels to get your, your toe stepped on. It doesn't feel good, but that's kind of what life is like. You know, it's like having your toe stepped on over and over again because we're our needs are not satisfied. We're thirsty and we try to satisfy our thirst with things other than God. Uh, at our core, we want to be involved with someone and have meaningful relationships and not feel threatened. We talked about how it's terrifying often to be open with other people, fearful that that person might look down upon us. Um, there's a story, uh, and we've probably all dealt with something like this with family. I'm going to read it. It's in the middle of page 74 in the book that I have, but it's a story um, about a young woman and the relationship with her father and how things became awkward. Um it says, one young woman told me that whenever she hinted to her father that she struggled both with her faith and with sexual temptation, he would artfully and quickly change the subject. The message was clear. I do not feel comfortable in knowing certain things about you, so do not tell me. And that's kind of, and it's, that's very sad, but it's very real. Um it's real. <laughs> You know, those awkward conversations with your children, the, the sex talk. Uh, I still remember when Rose and I had, we, you know, we had probably several, but we had one real good one where we sat everybody down, our three children, and talked to them about, you know, where babies come from and love and all that good stuff. Um, it was a Thanksgiving because I remember my, my daughter, uh, she was very young and she had her first um her first period. And so we had to have the talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, but, you know, it's not something I bring up all the time. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, it's 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 kind of weird, but, you know, um, that's just me. Maybe some people can handle it and they're just real open about it. But mm -hmm. this, the author talks about this story. It, you know, we have other things that we don't bring up at family get togethers because we know it's sensitive and it can open old wounds. And so we dance around topics. We've gotten really good at, at dodging. We're like, we're like Barry Sanders. I don't know if you remember him, the football player. Nobody could grab Barry Sanders. He was dipping and dodging and cutting and twisting and spinning. We do that in relationships too. <laughs> we're very evasive. <laughs> but uh, the, author, the author says the effect on his daughter was to create a terrible fear that no one could ever handle all that was inside her. Now, what a burden that put on her, right? Because her father wasn't open. She learned to be deeply afraid of any thoughts or feelings that might threaten others if she expressed them. So that's where stuff ends up below the waterline. That's what happens. You try to bring it up, you try to bring it to the surface, the people who you love and trust, they help you push it back down. And so we, we learn not to talk about those things. We hide those things that are very real to us on the inside. The author goes on, in her efforts to run from whatever could be unnerving, unnerving to others, her normal doubts and urges were strengthened, causing her to feel overwhelmed by questions about God and desires for sexual pleasure. Doubt and lust became overpowering obsessions that she could not escape. Beneath it all was a terribly frustrated longing to have someone see all of her and remain deeply involved. And that's where we all want to be, that we can just really be open without judgment, someone to listen to us, someone to help us, someone to walk with us along this journey. And I, I wonder if, you know, you've ever had to be that person. Have you ever been that mm -hmm. friend? And really what it is, is discipling. I wonder how much true discipling we do in our churches now. Mm. Or do we just come together and sing some songs and feel good and go back to our own little cubby holes and wait for next Sunday. Uh, <laughs> I know there was a time when I was single and, you know, didn't 
have a family and wasn't really had didn't have a lot of personal responsibilities of my own. I, I was much more giving of my time. And so it's, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But, you know, Jesus would have us once again to get involved, to disciple. You know, you think about Paul and Timothy, you know, Paul discipled Timothy. He was his son in the ministry. It wasn't, he wasn't his biological father, but he considered him his son. Mm-hmm. Jesus, Jesus discipled mm-hmm. the 12 disciples. They, they saw Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They traveled with Jesus. They, they slept in the same places. You know, they, 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 they attended his ministry events up on the mountain. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's ministry getting down and dirty and seeing people in uncomfortable situations and being wise counsel to them. And I think that's what the author, his end game is really not to psychoanalyze, but he keeps dropping hints that when we're not 100% whole, then we're not loving and we're not giving and we're not ministering like we ought to. So when the body of Christ fails to address the below the waterline, it keeps us from doing effective ministry. And I think that's his point. We, we pretend, we act, we put on a mask, but that doesn't help anybody. And it doesn't bring glory to God. This is, this is deep stuff. This is deep stuff. But he says, we are dependent by nature. We require resources outside of ourselves. We literally and absolutely need someone stronger than we are to look after us and to provide us with, provide us what we were designed to enjoy. You know, so just taking time to talk to somebody and encourage them and lift them up. You know, we all need that from time to time. And it can't just be the clergy. It can't just be Pastor Cowan, you know. Uh, It can't just be the associate minister. It can't just be the deacons. We are to encourage one another. Uh, iron sharpens iron. On page 75, the author says, Adam and Eve were to turn to God as the strong one on whom they could depend, and then to the other to both enjoy what the other uniquely provided and to give of themselves to enhance the other's pleasure. So it's God first and then others. And so that's that's part of the problem, I believe, as well, is that God isn't in the rightful place in our hearts. And so, therefore, you know, the world goes lacking. Uh, the gifts that you have are missing in in your in in your workplace, in your family, um, in the church. We all affect one another, whether you admit it or not. None of us are an island unto ourselves. We are connected. John 7, 37, the author brings this scripture up. He says, this is Jesus quoting, this is quoting Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7. So they're eating, the Pharisees are there. You know, this is, it sounds like this is some sort of a public event. And then Jesus stands up. And kind of makes this declaration. He says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. This was Jesus addressing a group of ritualistic people whose souls were numb and were unaware of their unsatisfied desires. And this is really a rhetorical question that Jesus asked, because really, we're all thirsty. He says, if anyone's thirsty, but I mean, really, we all are. And then on page 76, what did Jesus say? He said to come. He didn't deny, he didn't deny our thirst, nor does he focus on our thirst. He just tells us to come. And I like that approach. I like that approach. When I'm talking to, uh, unbelievers or people who are curious about my faith, I never lead in with, oh, you got to stop sinning. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I still have sins. I have to stop. And so 
uh, I just introduce them to Jesus. I start talking about the goodness of God. I start talking about that thirst that every, everyone has. And if you introduce people to Jesus, Jesus will come into their life and the Holy Spirit will then begin to convict them about their outward uh, uh, appearance, yeah. their actions, their, their um, you know, their sin. And so uh, that's how Jesus was, you know. Uh, he asked people, who's thirsty? Anyone who is thirsty, then come. He didn't say, oh, you got to get fixed right. Who's thirsty? <laughs> Stop sinning first and then come to me. No, he's he just said, if you're thirsty, come to me. And then he'll deal with the other stuff. But I think many times we have things out of order. We ask people to change in order to come to God. That's never been God's approach. He says, come to me. And then he will do the changing. All right, the new section. And that was kind of a recap from last week. The next section is, it's okay to hurt. It's okay to hurt. We long for what God cannot have. We long for what we cannot have until God arranges things to his standards. We will never have a pain-free life until that day comes. Now, we know one day we will be free from pain, death, no more lying, murdering, racism will be vanquished, uh, evil, um, everything that you can think of in this life that's negative will be passed away and everything will become new. But that pain-free life is never going to happen on this side. On page 77, the author says, it begs us to realize that sin is a far bigger problem than most of us think. I think that's an understatement <laughs> because, because uh, you know, most people don't even acknowledge the fact that they're a sinner. Matter of fact, they'll they'll label it. They'll they'll give it a name, and uh, they try to medicate it. They give it an ism, or uh, some sort of a diagnosis, rather than just calling it sin, because that's really what it is. Secular psychologists come up with new terms all the time. <laughs> They become buzzwords. Oh, I've got this. Oh, I've been diagnosed with this. Oh, I have that. And we use it as a crutch and an excuse to continue being the way we are. People will put their experience, their feelings over the truth of what God's word says. If they can find enough other people to agree with them and validate them, then they will they'll they'll basically put all their money on that instead of saying, well, what does God say about it? And we have to ask ourselves, we have to run that same test, you know, what does God say about this? The author says, the truth is we are an imperfect people who were built for perfection. Wow, what a what a contrast. We were made for perfection, but we're an imperfect people. And so there's the struggle. Once again, Paul talked about that struggle. You know, uh, I know what's right and I want to do right, but I find myself doing what's wrong. And he said, it's, it's sin in me. It certainly isn't Christ. And so we all have this struggle. Um, the author tells another, he's got lots of heart wrenching stories, but, uh, on page 78, he tells a story about his father's suicide. I guess when he was five years old, <laughs> his father found out <laughs> that his mother, uh, the father's wife and th this friend, the, the person that he was counseling, their mother was having an affair. She was ready to divorce this young man's father. And so he took a bunch of pills and basically committed suicide. They didn't tell the five-year-old son what had happened. They told him that uh, his father had had a massive heart attack. 
But of course, other family members knew what really happened, that the father basically killed himself because of his broken heart from his wife having this affair and wanting to divorce him. So the young, the boy who was five at the time thinks that his dad just had a heart attack. Well, 20, he was 27. That's 22 years later. 22 years later, he's a, he's a grown adult now. He was having a conversation with one of his cousins, an older cousin who knew what really happened. And the older cousin kind of threw it out there, you know, that his dad had committed suicide. And so you can imagine this young man's reaction to hearing this. Um, his mother had indeed married this uh, person she was having the affair with. Uh, a messy story, but not an unfamiliar story, right? Right. Okay. And so mm -hmm. he finds out, so he's lived most of his, his whole life at this point thinking that, you know, his dad died of natural causes. And you can imagine how that must have shaken him to the core. How could he look at his mother anymore the same way? Mm. This man who had been your stepfather from age, what, you know, five to 22, who you felt kind of came in, came in and rescued his mother, you know, he probably looked at him as, oh, this is a, he's a, like a knight in shining armor. Now he sees him as a cheater and a swindler. Mm -hmm. But he's a Christian. This young man is, he's a Christian. He believes in God, but how do you reconcile that? How do you not say, God, where were you? And we've all said that. I talk about our miscarriages that Rose and I have. I don't know why that happened. You know, it, we all have situations that, that hurt us, those things that uh, we don't have answers for. And so we, we cope. That's the only thing we can do. And this young man's way of coping was he would spend, he, he would memorize long passages of the Bible. I, I guess if you're going to do anything, <laughs> that's a good thing to do. Um, but, but his coping, uh, he was hoping that it would renew his mind uh, through time in the word. His life presented him with a level of pain that he was determined not to feel. How many of you have ever felt that before? Mm -hmm. I just can't deal with it. I can't deal with it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to just bury my head in the word. I'm going to stay in church. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to just focus, focus on God and it's going to go away. But we all know that doesn't work that way. It's still there. It's still there. Unfortunately, we're all in the same dilemma as this young man. The details might be different, maybe less extreme, maybe more extreme. We've all been through stuff. But there is an emptiness in the core of our being we simply do not want to face. We hurt. And so that's why he starts this section. It's called It's Okay to Hurt. Because you know what? You're not alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. This young man's obsession with Bible memorization was not to know God in a deeper way. His purpose was to relieve his pain. Mm. Wow. So once again, even, even something as honorable and as good, a, a disciplining yourself to memorize scripture can be done from a place of a wrong motive. He didn't, he, he wasn't memorizing scripture to get to know God better. He was trying to ease the pain. And you might say, well, what should he do? You know, um, the author says that we, we have to be very careful, even how we come to God, even how we worship God. Are we hiding things or are we truly trying to fill ourselves with with him and his love. Nothing is wrong with Bible memorization. Of course not. 
But when relieving his pain became the priority, he left the true path toward pursuing God. Wow. It's such a delicate line that each of us walk. You know, that's why, you know, there's one of my favorite quotes says, be kind to people because the people you meet each day are fighting a battle you know nothing about. Yes, that's right. That's right. I love yes. that quote. Yes. You're fighting. I'm fighting. Your neighbor's fighting. You just don't know what people are going through. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I strive to show grace to people and give people grace to be who they are because we're all becoming something. Hopefully we're growing to become more like Christ. But not everybody hasn't arrived. I haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. The greatest pastor of the biggest church in the world, they haven't arrived. We're all a work in progress, if we're honest. John 16, 33. These are the words of Jesus. Uh, so well, we're going to get a little deeper here, but, you know, so there's, there's a lot of churches, pastors, ministries, Christians who, I don't know, they portray this sort of pie in the sky lifestyle. And they look down upon those who hurt. Mm. like oh your faith isn't strong enough oh mm. you're weak stop mm. pouting and believe if it were that easy everybody would be on easy straight easy street but look what jesus said these things i have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world you shall have tribulation he said it right there life is not easy he didn't say in the world, in the world, you'll have joy every day. No, he said in the world, you'll have tribulation. But he said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So heaven on earth is not going to happen. Heaven will happen when heaven arrives. Then the author talks about facing the pain of life. Uh, he says, the pain of rejection, isolation, failure, and weakness is real. I don't know, hopefully the wheels in your heads is spinning as you read this and as you've studied this, and I know mine have. Uh, we try to numb the pain with eating, memorizing, by, memorizing the Bible. Uh, some people numb the pain with sex, cleaning. <laughs> Involving ourselves in church activities, we've got to do something to avoid the paralyzing ache we feel and fear so deeply. People let us down. And guess what? We let other people down as well. Jesus hurt. Did you know that? Yeah, Jesus struggled. Matthew 26, 39, 41. This is when Jesus went into the garden to pray. He took uh, Peter, James, and John with him. Jesus, and it says, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus was in pain here. This wasn't easy. Not even for the Son of God. Verse 40. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Jesus was disappointed. Yes, he was. Jesus just didn't walk on clouds. He he was he was very much a just as much as he was God. Jesus struggled. This was probably, I, I would say his, well, I guess on the cross was his worst moment, but, but this was a very painful time for him because he knew what was coming. He already saw it. <laughs> he already knew what was going to happen to him. 
And every fiber within his humanity was crying out at this point. He said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's something we should probably read our, read to ourselves and meditate on every day. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, because temptation is surely around the corner in some form or fashion. The spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. In other words, something is wrong with everything. And something is wrong with everyone. Uh -huh. <laughs> but just look at this passage here. You know, this is Jesus at one of his lowest moments, his toughest moments, his uh, um, weakest moments. And we're going to have those weak moments. If Jesus cried out, how much more then are we going to cry out? So for these super Christians <laughs> who uh, don't have any issues, I don't I don't believe they're being genuine. I think they're putting up a good, they're putting up a good front. Uh, if they've got it more together than Christ, then wow. Wow. I say wow too. I don't know what to say. Wow. All right. Then the author goes on on page 80. He says, so many Christians sense a pressure to feel good. I wish that more Christian leaders would more openly discuss their struggles. Uh, you know, Pastor has given his testimony. He talked about wanting to commit suicide before. He's been open about it, but he's still here. Amen. Yes. 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 We know he's been through a lot, but he's still fighting. Amen. Amen. And I really think that's where our testimony almost i won't say our testimony has more I, I won't here's this is just greg talking our testimony probably has more influence than the scriptures themselves not more power but more influence because people need to see that god works for somebody yes so they can see that he'll work for them so I hope I didn't say that wrong. Of course, the word of God has more power, but I think our testimony has a lot of influence. And I think the scripture says that we are to be living epistles, right? Right. Amen. So I, I don't think I'm twisting the scripture there when I say that. But think about the influence that you can have by sharing your testimony, by being that living example before someone, being honest about your struggles. Mm -hmm. It's helpful, yes. The song says, I am a living testimony. Yes. Second Corinthians 12, nine through 10. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Wow, Paul, Paul had, he had the right perspective. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. How about that? You want the power of Christ in your life? Oh, yeah. And he, and he says, rejoice. Rejoice when you go through those tough times. Remember, he talked about praise. Mm -hmm. Sunday. Glory in your infirmities. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, I am strong. In other words, Paul was like, bring it on. Yes. <laughs> Come at me, bro. <laughs> in street terms. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was willing to go through whatever he had to go through because with e every trial, every battle he faced, if he won, then he got stronger in Christ and others who saw him go through it got stronger. But then Paul would also say, well, if I lose, I lose doing what I who I love serving my God and I know that I'm going to get my reward in heaven. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. See, Paul, Paul had come to grips with 
the fact that he couldn't lose. <laughs> he can't lose. Mm -hmm. Victories on this side are victories on the other side. Mm -hmm. Amen. So if we all could get that mindset, just being submitted, you know, um, we all go through stuff. Don't let the stuff overwhelm you. Keep things in their perspective. And you can have victory through it all. There's a song we used to sing. Through it all, through mm -hmm. it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all. Mm -hmm. I've learned to on his word. I couldn't remember the chorus. Thank you, choir. <laughs> <laughs> through it all. Yes. Somebody say through it all. 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 Now, Psalm 23. Um, this is a great one to encourage anybody who's going through. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I still remember as a little kid reading this, and I didn't understand what that was saying. I said, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want him. <laughs> when I, was, when I, was little, I didn't understand what that meant. But then I said, yeah, it means you're not in want of anything. Yes. Since the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's the more contemporary translation of that. You know, the Psalms are very poetic in the Bible. I love the language of the Bible, but sometimes if you're not familiar with the language or don't have a good teacher to break things down for you. But yeah, I, I struggled with that first verse for many years. I'm like, what do you mean? I do want him. <laughs> But it's saying you're not in want of anything. Your soul is satisfied. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You know, green represents life and fertility and uh, prosperity. And so he lies, he helps us to be in places of prosperity. Even when we're poor, we can be prosperous. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He leads me beside the still waters. There's something about water, that refreshing. You know, we talked about being thirsty. All of us are thirsty. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. We're born thirsty. Mm -hmm. We follow the good shepherd and he leads us to still water, not, not, not rough water. There's enough rough, rough waters out there. But he leads us by still waters, which are refreshing. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. That's something powerful about his name. You know, uh, in my sermon Sunday, uh, I, I read that verse in James where it says, God is jealous of the spirit he has in you. And so I think some, sometimes we forget that God, once again, it, it's about, it's, he saved us for his own glory. And so he can surely hold up his end of the bargain. You know, you represent him. And sometimes when I pray, I say, Lord, I'm your child. Yes. Not that he doesn't know, but I have to remind myself. <laughs> yes. Lord, you're my father. You, you know what I need better than I need, better than I know for myself. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I'm I'm a Christian. I have his name. I have the name of Jesus in my new name. I wasn't his child, but now I am his child. And I, I just let him know that I know I can rely on you, God. Mm -hmm. He leads me in the path of righteousness, not for my sake, but for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. This is a great verse here. I heard Tony Evans talking the other day. You know, he talked about the valleys and mountains of life. And he said, if you think about a mountain, 
most mountains come to a peak at the top, right? So it, when you come to the top of that mountain, it, that 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 peak mountain peak mountaintop experience doesn't last very long <laughs> because it's it's not a lot of room up there yeah. but the valley is very long <laughs> and the valley is very deep mm-hmm. but he says it's in the valley times where we get to see God at his best mm-hmm. oh, yes yeah. yeah. That's when we see God come to his rescue. That's when we see Jesus Mm -hmm. put his cape on and come and save the day. So so those valley times, that's, and he said, when you're up on the mountain, that's when you learn how to praise. Because in the valley, you're going to need that praise to lift you back up to the side. Amen. Amen. He says, you're with me. And the, and the cool part is just, it, it's not really death, though. It's just a shadow of death. <laughs> it's just spooky. It looks mm-hmm. like death. Because we know death has no victory over our eternal souls. You know, our, our body will die. But our soul is going to live on forever. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a shadow. It's not real mm-hmm. death. We'll never be separated from our God. Matter of fact, when you leave your body, you're closer to him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Lord. And I love this rod and the staff analogy. Uh, The staff is the thing with the hook on it. That's Mm -hmm. That's what he would use to, the shepherd would use to lead the sheep and rescue the sheep. That's why it had a hook so that when the sheep fell off the cliff or fell into a pit, they could pull it back. Hook. Yeah. And pull them up, right? The rod was a beating stick. That was the weapon. That's what he would use, the shepherd would use to beat off bears and and wolves and things coming after the sheep. So he's both our protector and he's our rescuer. Amen. Amen. Verse five, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. (laughs) <laughs> uh, when i think about that that must be some kind of table you know uh the bible talks about the wedding feast is going to be a great table mm-hmm. well, you know but he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies so your enemies will see you prosper <laughs> thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I do declare he's he's preparing a house. Amen. Amen. Jesus said it. Jesus said it. I wouldn't have told you if it weren't so. But I'm going away to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome passages. So when we get into our low moments, um, you know, we we have scripture to encourage us. Sometimes you have to encourage yourself. Sometimes pastor can't be there. Sometimes you Mm -hmm. may not be in a place to pull up your favorite gospel song, but the word of God, we got to hide it in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Encourage your soul. Now, the author says, the other trap that we face is to exaggerate this matter of transparency to a point where we dwell more on our problems than on the beauty of Christ. And it's easy to fall into that pit too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's the public Christians that he talks about here who present their lives in such a way that leaves us wondering what's wrong with me when there may be nothing wrong with you at all. One scripture that helps kind of recenter me is Romans 8, 28. All things work together for for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So when I look at my life and say, why am I failing at this? Why is this not happening? Why is this door being closed? Why can't I get to where I'm going to be? And, And I read that scripture and it's like, well, I'm probably right where I need. 
And so God is using the situation I'm currently in this season to either build up things in my life, or maybe there's somebody I need to be ministering to in that situation. And if I'm not doing what I need to do, I might be prolonging why I'm still in the situation. But um, but yeah, we we just we can never make our problems bigger than our God. This is certainly not. But these mm -hmm. the public Christians, the 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 Pharisees, in other words, the the ones who go around pointing out wrong and telling you you're not your faith isn't strong enough, and you know the message comes across to millions of Christians that relief from pain and something approaching sinless perfection is actually attainable. I've heard, I've heard preachers say that I've known uh, there, my home church. One of, there was a great Bible teacher, Sunday school teacher. And I remember <laughs> he told the church that he doesn't sin anymore. Woo. Mm. Okay. Oh. I guess he had he had arrived. Uh, <laughs> he wanted he must he wanted the church to feel that way that he didn't, but you know, first John says that if any man says he has no sin, he is a liar, and the truth yeah. is not. <laughs> not in him. So when he stood up and said that, he just sinned. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He just yeah. sinned. You know, we, he just canceled himself. Yes. <laughs> but there are those, there are those maybe well-meaning Christians that they believe you can have paradise now and then more of it later. The promise of paradise today was made to a dying thief on a cross next to Jesus. But here is what Jesus spoke to those whom he left on the earth. Uh, he didn't promise paradise. You know what? Uh, I'm going to stop there. But um, I, I like the way the author really keeps you. He keeps you thinking here. You know, um, he's taking a. I was, I guess we say an, an unorthodox, maybe look at, at our Christianity. You know, this is probably not stuff you may hear on a Sunday. But it's good. It, it, he's he's helping us peel back the layers of the onion, you know. He's helping us get to the root to start thinking and stop pretending about things. Because really, you know, Christianity, once again, it, the only way to be a Christian is to be an authentic, right? Right. Amen. There, there's no, there really, there won't be any fake Christians in heaven. No <laughs> way. Yep, there, there's plenty of there's plenty of maybe pretend Christians in church, and that's okay, you know, because I was uh, I shared this passage with my my brothers in the text message the other day about where Jesus was talking about the wheat and the tares, the parable of the tares. Um, uh, a farmer had planted a vineyard or uh, uh, some wheat, and the some of his workers went out in the field and said, oh, master, master, there's tares growing up with the wheat. Do you want us to, to pull them out? Tares basically look like wheat, but they don't produce any, any uh, fruit. And the master said, nope, leave them, let them grow together. Uh, the, when the harvest time come, we'll take the tares and bundle them up and burn them in the wheat. We will harvest. And once again, that was describing what heaven will be like, what heaven is like, you know, here on earth, we mingle, we mix with the world, but, you know, we are different. And it, once again, it goes back to pastor's theme for 2023, it seems, is this, mm -hmm. the seem right salvation. The tares seem like wheat, but we know they're not. It's not for us to try to separate. You can't judge anybody. You don't have a heaven or a hell to send anybody to. So it's not for us to call out, oh, you're not saved or you're not this and you're not that, or you should be this or you should just worry about yourself. <laughs> Say, follow me as I follow Christ. That's about the best thing you can offer somebody. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus will do the separating, the wheat from the tear, the sheep from the goats. That's not our place. All right, it's 759. We're going to go ahead and close. Um, once again, just lifting up uh, Deacon Rydell in prayer. Uh, he, he just texted me back and said he's doing well. He appreciates the prayer. Um, others who are, uh, I know, um, I think Sister Sister Gail Shepherd, I believe she was saying she was having a procedure. we we'll lift her up in prayer. Others who are recovering. Um, I don't know if we have any other prayer requests from those who are online. I can't see the ones on Facebook, but any prayer requests? Mm -hmm. This is Gail. I like prayer for myself and my family. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, let's go to the Lord as we close out. Father, thank you for another uh, deep session tonight. We thank you for this book. We thank you for this author. We thank you, Lord, for truth. We thank you for the trials and tribulations you allow us to go through because they help us to become more like Christ. Christ is our example. And if Christ is our example, then we're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to cry sometime. But Lord, through it all, we've learned to trust in you. We've learned to trust in the Father. We've learned We've learned to listen to your Holy Spirit. Continue to teach us, Father. Continue to help us to uh, not adopt the thinking of this world, but to stand true to your word. Help us to be not ashamed of the gospel, for it is powerful. Help us, Lord, not, us, not to hide our testimony. Our testimony has a great influence. Father, we ask you to Help us to learn the lessons we need to learn through our trials and our tribulations as we get closer and closer to your return, Father. You're preparing us for what's next in our life. You're shaping us. You're molding us. You're pruning us. And that process doesn't feel good. But Lord, we're going to come forth as pure gold one day as we go through the fire, the refiner's fire. You are the potter and we are the clay. Sometimes we have to get on that wheel and you have to make us and remake us and mold us and reshape us into a vessel that's fit for the kingdom. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We know that you're up to good and never evil. You never tempt us. You never put us in situations beyond that which we can bear. Well, you always provide a way of escape. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Continue to heal. Continue to bless. Continue to deliver. Continue to restore. Continue to uh, draw us closer to yourself. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, amen. God bless you. you. God be with you. Be well and be safe. Thank you. You too. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. You as well. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Have a blessed night. Blessed night. God bless. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.